Hey everyone, Chris here. Welcome back to another episode of AI Learns. Today, I'm gonna to show how an AI is able to learn to play a game when it only has access to the pixels on screen. What you're seeing now is an AI learning to go after a white sphere without being explicitly programmed to. A couple things first. I'll be using Unity to make the game and Python to create the actual AI. I'll also be going in more technical depth than I usually do. So if this is something you like, let me know. And if it's something you hate, also let me know. Got it? Cool, let's get started. I consider Gridworld to be the hello world of reinforcement learning. A hello world project is generally the program people start with when beginning a new programming language, so it's meant to be pretty easy. Here, the AI is trying to make it to a goal while avoiding things that can hurt it. Each turn, the agent can either do nothing, go up, down, left, or right, but every time step in the game gives a small negative reward to the AI. This is meant to encourage it to complete the game as quickly as possible. Normally this isn't too hard because you're given the positions of the objects in the world and the AI only needs to navigate a static environment. I'm going to make this a bit more challenging by changing the environment each time the AI plays the game. The AI will also only be given raw pixels as input and needs to figure out where the objects are based off that. Whenever the AI gets to a goal, it receives a plus one reward and if it hits the fire, it receives minus one. In both cases, the episode ends and the next one begins. You might be wondering what makes this all possible. Well, it's double deep queue learning with experience replay. That might sound confusing at first, so let's break it down. Queue learning is a way to map a state action pair to a reward. That just means for each state and for each action, there is a possible reward. In the past, this was done with a simple lookup table, but it's not very effective with large state spaces, and anything involving pixels on screen is automatically going to have a large state space. Deep queue learning is a way to process the large state space. Rather than using a simple lookup table, a deep neural network will be used instead. This is what DeepMind did when they started beating Atari games, and it's what made them popular. It maps a state to a list of values for each action, and the agent then chooses the action that will result in the best possible reward. Experience replay is the act of taking a sequence of your previous state, action, reward, and current state, and learning from it. Instead of just experiencing that state transition once, you have a chance to replay the exact same experience and potentially learn from your mistakes. For instance, the state transition down here might only occur once during the life of the AI. Experience replay acts as a sort of memory where the AI can experience the same transition again and see if it would do anything different now that it's learned more. So what makes it double? Well, at a high level, the goal is to take an action that results in the best reward. Imagine throwing a ball at a target. If you miss, you go to the ball and you throw it again. Well, when there's only one deep queue network, once you throw the ball, the target moves also since they both depend on the same parameters. By adding a second one, you help keep the target stationary for longer. You might be wondering how the AI is able to learn shapes in order to know what it should go after. At a high level, it uses a deep neural network with some convolutional layers inside. Instead of treating each pixel independently as input, you can use a convolution and apply a kernel over the image. This drastically reduces the number of inputs and can speed up the training process. These kernels produce filters and each layer can produce a number of filters. You can think of these filters as what gets through. For instance, a coffee filter allows coffee to pass through while stopping grounds. In music, a high pass filter allows higher frequency signals to pass through. The early layers learn simple things like vertical and horizontal lines. So anything that has a vertical or a horizontal line in the image will pass through. Middle layers might learn to combine multiple shapes to produce more complex images. In modern computer vision, it might learn facial features like a nose or lips. The last layer brings everything together to say whether or not it's a square, circle, human face, cat, orange, palm tree, etc. In this case, the AI is only concerned about simple shapes. Here we have a sphere and an X. And here to help show what that means is this cute picture of a puppy. If you apply this 3x3 convolution over the picture of a puppy, you get this. But if you do the same thing to the state that the AI sees, you get this. Now, let's look at a couple different 3x3 convolutions and see how they affect our images. Notice here that the middle value changes from 3 to 8 in the convolution. 
And notice now how the entire thing changes and includes imaginary numbers. Don't worry too much about the imaginary number. It's just a way to say that there's an x convolution and a y convolution included in the same matrix. Ooh, that's one spooky puppy. So how do you decide what those values should be? That's what the convolutional neural network figures out. How? Well, that's a bit beyond the scope of this video. So for now, just think of it like magic. The really cool thing I like about this type of design is the AI can go into an environment it hasn't experienced before and perform pretty well. Take for instance this environment. It has four fires and two goals. It's the environment that the AI was trained in. Sure, you can take the agent and you can retrain it in any environment and it will learn it. But you can also just place it into a new one without training it and they'll still be able to solve quite a few scenarios. Why does it work? Well, because instead of just learning a set stage, the AI is actually able to figure out which shapes are good and which ones are bad and be able to perform its own pathfinding algorithm. So does this always work? Absolutely not. Deep Q networks are really cool, but they do suffer from being greedy. It can make exploration harder and usually results in the AI needing a lot of training. This one was trained over the period of 24 hours and ended up playing just over 1.2 million games. One way I kept track of how well it was performing was by looking at a rolling average of 100 games and seeing what percentage it was able to win. Even here you can see the AI unable to figure out what it should do, which results in it just going back and forth until it dies. Taking a look at the stats, you can see that on average the AI does pretty well and for the most part has over a 90% solve rate. It also only took about 40,000 games before it got there. The last thing to show is how it all started. This type of AI benefits from exploration, so the majority of movement in the beginning is random. From that random movement, it's able to figure out which options are good and which are bad. In the early stages, even if the AI thinks it knows the best move, it has a high chance at choosing exploration instead. As the AI learns more about its environment, it begins focusing more on exploitation. You may have heard about exploration versus exploitation trade-off. All that means is whether the AI chooses to explore the environment to find a potentially better solution, or exploit what it knows and choose the current best. Now, I know Grid World isn't the most exciting game in the world, and this video has way more explanation than my previous videos, but I think it's important to have a base understanding of this since DQN paves the way for more advanced AI to come. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to drop a like. If you want to see more AI-related content, consider subscribing. I'm also going to start using Twitter to showcase small feats of AI and some of the hiccups along the way.